In part six of our series, The Fruit of the Spirit, we consider goodness. What is the difference between spiritual and non-spiritual goodness? Are your questions about goodness addressed in the Bible? If there were no universal truth about goodness, how would we all behave? Here's Greg Garza. Our passage is 5.22 in Galatians, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. And I have to tell you, in all candor, and maybe with a little bit of, of humor, that I was just absolutely shocked that Paul, in the, the, the verses immediately previous to this, did an outstanding job describing Greg before he came to the Lord. He says, some, some of the things of what you were guilty are debauchery, impurity, selfish ambition, envy, drunkenness, and the like. I felt out of, uh, in this disclosure, that I would not say the rest of the things that he said because I don't think it's proper. It's embarrassing, and plus, it's not good in polite company. So, let, let's begin by talking about some definitions. The two types of uh, definitions I want to talk about are, are the secular and, and the spiritual or the biblical. What the dictionary tells us, the kinds of things that it talks about in terms of a definition are the quality of being good in particular, moral excellence, virtue, kindly feelings, kindness, generosity, friendliness, generosity, goodwill, grace, graciousness, honesty, integrity, plus about 25 more that are in the Bible. Interestingly, when you go to the Bible and do some research on goodness, you really do not get like a biblical, or excuse me, a dictionary type definition. Instead, you get verses. And and the verses range from depressing to uplifting, okay? Romans 3.10. None is righteous, no one does good, not even one. And then on the opposite side, you have Romans 8, 28. We know all things work together for good for those who and are all according to his purpose. Right. And then, of course, there's Galatians. The fruit of the Spirit is goodness. And then in Micah, he says, he has told you, O man, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you but to do justice and to love kindness, and to walk humbly with your God. So I'm pondering over these things, and I'm thinking, and this literally happened, 2 o'clock in the morning, I'm laying there in bed, and I got this harebrained idea. I'm going to talk to a number of holy people. That's holy with a small h. Okay, you know what that means? (laughs) Holy means what? Set apart for God, exactly. And that's what I did. So what I did is I I asked them to answer these questions. And I asked them to do it in an email so that that would be easy for them. So the first question is, when you think of goodness, it's in the biblical sense, what do you think of? And these are questions I would, would, maybe you you would consider pondering yourself. Okay, because we're constantly in the fray, we're constantly in the battle from the time we wake up in the morning until we go to bed at night. When you think of goodness, what do you think of? The second question, when you think of the goodness you strive for in your own life, how does it manifest? What does it look like? Third question, when you think of goodness in others, is there someone that always comes to mind? Fourth what quality of goodness do that person or those people radiate in their life? And the last question, and this is the stinker, what do you feel is evidence in your own life walk that makes you understand that you are moving toward biblical goodness? So here's what my little survey revealed. I'm not going to give you all the answers. I'm going to give you little little clips, sound bites, if you will. So the first question, what do you think of biblical goodness? When you think of it, what do you think? 
First response, only God is good. Next, goodness is righteousness, how well one can live and think in ways not sinful. Third, God is good. One from a brother, selfless, unconditional agape love, like Ruth, like David on his best day, like Jesus every day. He quotes Paul, I have learned to be content whatever the circumstances. So biblical goodness is related to God. There is no one good. It's back to Romans. So these are the people who are pillars in our church today. These are the kinds of thoughts that they're having when they think about goodness. When you think of goodness in your own life, how does it manifest? One says, in my own life I see goodness as a goal that I strive toward. Another, when I truly pursue Christ, I get a sense that there is, in fact, good in my life. But it's always related to his goodness being imparted to and through me. It manifests in generosity, hospitality, willingness, sacrifice of my own needs and the fruit of the Spirit. Kindness to people, especially difficult ones. Control of my pride, anger, lust, and other impulses to sin. Living with purpose, living with a sense of God near me. And then one sister wrote, doing what is right, in, no, this isn't a sister, doing what is right in both private and in public. I'm not mentioning any names here for a purpose, reason. Trying to relate to others in ways that move them toward God so they can be a blessing to others. Anytime I say no to my sinful nature and yes to the Holy Spirit. There are mostly outward acts, these manifestations. Sacrificing for the good of another, being generous and serving. Third question, when you think of goodness in others, is there someone that always comes to mind? This is a, this is a good one. Goodness in others is merely a reflection of God's goodness. I think of my parents, mentors, who have invested in me, in my spouse. Two said my mom, one said several people. Another said someone that's willing to sacrifice their own self-interest for the ultimate good of another person. And then the last one said, in not a sentence, Seth, Debbie Hall, Allie Adams. <laughs> Fourth question, what quality of goodness does that person radiate in their lives, in their life? Those people radiate a love that goes beyond what they themselves could generate. Agape love, that is God-powered. Sacrificial love, always eager to help someone in need. Kindness and care, especially to me at times I did not deserve it. Gentleness, but with direction and strength. Wisdom, love for God and peace. Is this kind of thing radiating from our lives? They are doing what's right and good as seen by God and man. They are relating in a good way that reflects the wonder of God's delight and love for people. Real love and worship of Jesus Christ, selfless serving, living an authentic life, not pretending to be someone they are not. Last, very other-centered, continuing to do good for others even when, she was talking about her mom, when she is going through difficult times herself. The last question is, what do you feel is evidence in your life that you're moving toward biblical goodness? Answers, selflessness, compassion, and hope, and the fruit of the Spirit. When I can put someone else's needs ahead of mine, it does, and this is a, the, the telling issue here, when I can put someone else's needs ahead of mine, comma, it doesn't come naturally. <laughs> Another, I don't know. I often... Know when I've done well and when I haven't. Sometimes, though, I just forget and get caught up in the flow of the moment. Anybody have a busy life? <laughs> Sacrifice for others, laying aside ego and engaging with the real person in front of me, serving the master well. I have learned so much and grown stronger in my faith through a couple of hideous trials in my life. I have learned to trust God with the outcome. When I see my reaction to situations, I know for certain I'm moving toward goodness. 
I have seasons where I do more for others and seasons when I am more self-centered. I do best when I catch myself in my self-centeredness, give that up to God and move toward others even when I don't feel like it. God willing, as I grow, I will become characterized by doing good rather than being by my self-centeredness. But it will always be a battle. Do you see some common themes here? Selflessness, consideration of others, being other-centric. You can say yes. <laughs> so the question, and, and what you're going to find as I go through this today, I'm going to be asking questions, and I'm doing it not necessarily because I have all the answers for you, but I believe it's something that as Christians, as people who follow Christ, must do regularly. We must ask questions. We must look at what we're doing and what we're thinking to be sure that we're tracking with him. Pretty simple stuff, really. Unfortunately, it's not easy. So my question is this. Are these things we all just do naturally? So my, here's one of my hypotheses. Our verse tells us that the fruit of the Spirit is this and this and this and this. But what I notice is that the first fruit is love. Interestingly, Jesus is known as the first fruit also. Goodness, the topic of my talk, is actually an outgrowth. Therefore, I contend that there can be no fruit if we don't love. Does that make sense? But how can we love when we know this? What does the Old, heart, the Old Testament say about our hearts? The heart is deceitful above all things. And beyond cure, who can understand it? Does that sound like a statement about selfishness or selflessness? Selfishness, yeah. So my question is, is like I said, is are these things that we do naturally? No. And then the follow-up question is, is the, is the heart, the natural heart, juxtaposed to goodness because in the natural state it cannot love unselfishly? especially the love that God wants us to manifest. You see what's happening here? Our natural self versus the self that God wants us to be, the person that God wants us to be. So there's a, there's a, a counterpoint there that if we don't recognize that, and just because we come to the Lord doesn't mean that that fleshly part of us, that fleshly selfishness goes away. It doesn't, okay? As you saw from the answers, it's not natural. It's hard for me to do. It's things I have to work on. So what I'm submitting to you is this. It's not something that we do, but it is God that works in our life to bring us to a point where we recognize a need for him, that we recognize a need for a savior, that we recognize a need for Jesus. So let's talk about love for a second. Who remembers the love verse? What is love from 1 Corinthians? And by the way, I don't know if you've ever done this, but when you read the verse in your copious free time, which I'm sure you're going to do after this message, uh, I'm going to read it to you anyway, you'll notice that you could, you could substitute Jesus in virtually every aspect of this. Love is patient. Love is kind. It doesn't envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It is not rude. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. Jesus keeps no record of wrongs. If you're saved. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, and always perseveres. Question, do you love? We're going to come back to this. In this last week, Pastor Seth sent a devotional out on goodness, and I, I just got smacked right in the face with the very first day. He points out that our secular culture, in our secular culture, goodness is thought of as in relative terms. And he points out four thoughts that people hold. I'm not perfect, but I'm basically a good guy or gal. What's good for you is not necessarily what I believe is good for me. So please don't impose your standard of good on me. My definition of good is all that matters. Selfish or selfless? Selfish. 
The point that he's making in this is that there is no objective standard of what is good. It's all relative. That there is no universal standard or universal truth. Do you see the danger in that? If there is no universal truth, then we, mankind, have license for any type of behavior. Do we see that manifesting today in, in, in our country? I mean, seriously, give it a thought for a second. What kind of behavior are the people of our country manifesting? Is this behavior a reflection of uh, a consideration for any kind of profound truth? Largely, no. And, and is, as an aside, I, I think a sad point is, is that we as Christians sometimes tend to be a little too silent about the fact that there is a universal truth, there is good. And it, it isn't just something to be given lip service, it's something to be acted on. With no universal truth, with no objective definition of good, do you see how the philosophies of communism and socialism can then take over the lives of people. If there is no truth or good, then these philosophies or these political things make perfect sense. You're not a person of any worth. You have no consequence. Therefore, as a part of the system, you just are. So just do what I say, do what we say, and, and maybe things will be good for you, maybe not. So why did Jesus come? I'm stealing some, some questions here from the Truth Project. He came so that we would know the truth, and the truth does what? Makes us free. Free from the punishment we deserve, free to experience God working in our lives, free to love, and free to grow toward real goodness. So Greg, where are you going with all this? Question. Do we really want the fruit of the Spirit in our lives? Do we want real goodness? You don't have to answer that. I'm going to presume yes. So where our verse tells us the fruit of the Spirit is this and this and this, the first fruit is love, if there can't be any fruit without love, what do we do? Godly love is really beyond our comprehension. Godly love is beyond our comprehension. Think of John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he only begotten son. Can you imagine for a second from our natural hearts a love so selfless that you would actually give up your one and only son to die a horrible, horrible, ugly death for people who are just flat out ugly and undesirable? It, it's incomprehensible. Okay? And what I'm really trying to tell you here is, is that something has to happen within us. Something from the outside or plus our decision needs to take place so that we can begin to experience and understand what salvation really means. So is it reasonable to expect the fruit of the Spirit based on our own efforts? Yes or no, we'll do here. Nope. No. Right. Why? Because our own efforts are selfish, okay? If we do not have a, a point of reference, if we do not have something by which to measure, okay? If we do what the gospel says, if we turn away from the things that we know are sinful, that Paul writes about in Corinthians 5, 19 through 21, if we surrender then we begin to move in a direction that we need to move. The good news is that we can experience the fruit of the Spirit. The not so good news is that it doesn't happen in a finger snap. So the question I want to ask you is this. A question, another question. Does your life work? Is your life working the way you want it to work in every aspect? Do you have an profound confidence that your life is going to work the way that God wants it to work? The answer should be yes. And 
the follow-up to that is, is, do I really want the fruit of the Spirit? So if you answer yes to this question, you've already accepted Jesus as your personal Lord, then remember what all the law and the prophets hangs on, which was to love God and love people, love your neighbor as yourself. Or as Micah says, do what the Lord requires, justice, kindness, and to walk humbly with your Lord. If you want your work, life to work, if you want goodness and the rest of the fruit of the Spirit and have not surrendered your life to Christ, then beginning the journey to walk humbly with your Lord is as easy and as surprisingly simple as a sincere prayer. Wherever you are today, if you do not have the relationship with our Lord Jesus Christ that you need in order to experience the fruit, pray a very simple prayer. Lord, I confess that I am a sinner. I willfully turn from my sinful ways and I ask you for your forgiveness and ask you to come into my life and into my heart. Pray that prayer sincerely. Jesus comes into your life. A humble walk with your God will bring all the fruit of the Spirit, including goodness, into your life. Your life will work. So let's pray. Great and awesome God, Abba, the Father of lights, the giver of all good gifts, you have given us freely without cost the gift of salvation. Lord, for those of us who have accepted you as Lord and, and Savior, I pray, we pray that you would work in our lives, that you were empowered us by your Holy Spirit to walk closely with you to be ever and more deeply and profoundly in love with you, Jesus. And for those who are now just coming to you, Lord, be in their lives, be in their minds, be in their hearts. Let them begin their walk with you humbly and with the knowledge that all the things that you promise in your, in your word will manifest in their lives, that they will begin the move toward becoming the kind of people we will become the kinds of people that you want us to become. Come now, Jesus. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. We at Pacific Church of Irvine invite you to join us every Sunday at 930. You can also visit our website at pacificchurch.com.